Hello everyone and welcome to a week of Linux news for the 2nd of October 2016. So I want to start with what I've been up to this week. So I've been working on a new podcast section of my website. So I've built it with MariaDB, or SQL, and got it interfaced nicely with PHP. Now it's my first time using SQL, so it has been a bit of a learning curve. But I've got it going, and I'm just going through the final testing at the moment. So yes, the link is up there on my website if you want to take a look at it, but I'm not giving you the direct link to it in this YouTube video. I just want to make sure it can uh, withstand a bit of uh, steady usage so far before we open the link out further. So let's take a look at what's been happening in the news. And we'll start with a new desktop that's available for the Raspberry Pi called Pixel. It is the Pi Improved X Environment Lightweight. So it's a fork of LXDE and the developers pretty much ripped out everything that's non-essential out of it and made it run a lot faster on the Raspberry Pi. There's some screenshots of the desktop and this is the splash screen. Welcome to Pixel and the Raspberry Pi logo. There's a picture of a few of the desktops that have been included. Some very nice photography there. The icons. Looks fairly basic, but hey, you can't go expecting a glamorous system for something that's got to be so lightweight. But everything I'm seeing just looks simple and usable. I was impressed with how well the Raspberry Pi Model 3 ran the Ubuntu Mate system. Keeping on the theme of desktops, there's a new release of LXQT version 0.11. The LXQT is the future of LXDE, but it's a new lightweight desktop based on Qt. They seem to be taking their time a bit, because uh, I'm sure it's been around for a few years now, and Lubuntu have still chosen not to use it in the 16.10 version. Kind of shows they're keeping with a more stable system, but you're just almost thinking, well, when are we going to see Lubuntu using LXQT? I suppose when they consider it ready for formal release. In terms of improvements, the user experience has been improved, and a significant number of bugs have been fixed. PCMan FM Qt, the file manager for LXQt, has seen a lot of improvement in its user interface. For example, the placement of icons is much better and it's possible to store settings per folder. Yet another desktop which has been released is Mate version 1.16. The improvements here are focusing more on GTK3 compatibility as well as application and theme support for GTK 3.22 and more applications built against GTK 3 only. So I have to kind of think of the irony here that Mate started off as a fork of GNOME Classic or GTK 2 and has now moved towards GNOME 3, GTK 3. Okay, so moving towards what they left behind. Okay, moving on. Ubuntu 16.10 codenamed Yakety Yak Beta 2 has finally been released. It was delayed a bit, although a couple of the derivatives were released last week. Ubuntu itself wasn't actually formally released until this week. Here's a crowdfunding project for the first open source physically secure computer called Orwell. Now with five days left, they've near enough doubled their funding goal. So it's going to come with an option of Ubuntu or Windows 10. Windows 10 costs more. So the features of it, so it has an Intel Skylake M3 or M7, integrated graphics, couple of USB ports, 8 gig of RAM, 120 or 480 gig solid state disk. So to boot it up, it requires authentication with an NFC card, and that's done at the BIOS stage, so it's not even dependent on the operating system. There's encryption on the solid state disk, but to really top it off, there's this enveloping active mesh I'll read out some of the article here. Opening the clamshell will relieve pressure switches which will cause the secure microcontroller to delete the solid state disk's encryption key. The secure microcontroller constantly monitors the mesh by sending random data through it and measuring the impedance of each trace. Drilling or cutting the LDS clamshell breaks the continuity of the printed circuit, again resulting in deletion of the encryption key. Shorting, or bypassing or otherwise changing the geometry of any of the traces will result in an impedance change, which will similarly result in the deletion of the encryption key. You can always carefully open the clamshell yourself if you want to know what's inside, but not without destroying the encryption key. After closing it, you will have to generate a new solid state disk encryption key and reinstall the entire operating system. If you're paranoid about keeping your data secure, uh, this could well be the computer for you. 
LibreOffice is now six years old. And they've released a new version of LibreOffice, version 5.2.2. This is just three weeks after their most recent release and they've, and they've fixed 57 issues. That's a lot of work in a short time. Here's an application which I won't be doing a review on, but it's called WebTorrent Desktop. It allows you to stream your torrents before the download completes. So a video player to watch torrents on. <laughs> yeah, you can see why I will not be doing a review of that. WebTorrent Desktop is available for Linux, macOS, and Windows. They've also supplied pre-built deb files for Ubuntu and Debian. It sounds an interesting application, but sadly, the interest could also catch the eyes of Hollywood and the movie industry, and they could come down quite harshly on the developers. The new Mate desktop is now available in Solus OS. So I did a review on Solus a little while back, and uh, it's certainly proving to be quite an interesting Linux distro. They're building up their own system from scratch and using the Budgie desktop. And take a look at the video if you want to know more about it. One of the updated applications caught my eye. Krita. I hadn't realised they'd implemented more of Qt in their application repository. Because I said at the time of the video, what would really hold me back is not being able to install Kden Live. So if they're leading towards the point of being able to install Kden Live, uh, yeah, I guess I could try it out. Although I have to say I really do like the Plasma 5.7 desktop. Ooh, I don't know. An article from Gaming on Linux that Steam now has over 2,500 games available for Linux in the Steam OS. In comparison, Mac OS has 3,791 and Windows has 10,260. So yes, Windows is still king for gaming, but the numbers are increasing for Linux. Mozilla Firefox OS is officially killed off. And also, Mozilla are dropping support for Windows XP and Windows Vista. Can't blame them too much there, because XP is officially dead and unsupported by Microsoft, and Vista's probably now so low in terms of usage. It's not worth investing time and resources into supporting what could be such a low audience. So it's a shame that Firefox OS never really took off. So I wonder if Ubuntu on mobile and tablet can continue where Firefox OS failed. I saw this terminal command on OMG Ubuntu this week to get your top 10 most typed commands from your bash history. On my main system, we have bash, ssh, and sudo being the top three, yeah. Then after that, dark places, that's the dark places quake engine, and montage, it's for joining multiple images together. On one of my Raspberry Pis, we have sudo, python, and git are all at the top three, and after that being tail and cat. I use tail for finding out when I made errors in PHP. Well, there's nothing in there today because the log file has been cycled. Some distros that have been released this week. We have Proxmox VE 4.3. So it's based on Debian Jesse and it's used more for holding virtualized systems. So it's really only useful for server-based systems. Shapu version 24 has been released. It's based on Fedora and uses the GNOME desktop. What, so kind of like Fedora itself then? Well, their selling point over Fedora is that they've adopted a more relaxed approach to software licenses. And finally, we have a new version of Cubes OS, version 3.2. I believe this is based on Debian, but it's more of a unique operating system in that they've gone for a containerization approach, kind of like Docker. So each application is sandboxed and in theory can't interfere with any other applications, so it would make it considerably harder to hack that system. So would a buffer overflow be safely contained within the one program and not spread to the rest of the operating system? Okay, sounds an interesting concept. And now I've picked a viewer question that could probably do with more answers than I could give. Diego Chavero asks, Hello everyone, can somebody tell me if Ubuntu 1604 has more system requirements or needs more resources than previous versions? So I've replied, for me it's been about the same as Ubuntu 1404. The trouble is, my system, although it's old, is not exactly underpowered, so the official requirements are pretty much the same as Ubuntu 1404. But what has it been like for everyone else? Have you found 1604 being more bloated and needing more resources? Or have you found it more lightweight, or about the same? And that concludes a week of Linux news. So if you liked the video, please share it with your friends. And thanks for watching, I'll see you all later.